good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for joining us on the first of a series of market briefings that we're going to be running this week and, and next to update um, you all on the various market situations around the world. For those who don't know me, my name is Lee Sorensen from the Industry uh, Relations Area at Tourism Australia, and I'll be uh, hosting this morning's session, running through the housekeeping now, and then facilitating a question and answer at the end. Uh, while our borders are obviously closed, and no, sorry, we won't have any updates on reopenings here today, although I know that's probably the number one question, we do want to keep you informed around what's going on and what we're up to and give you the opportunity to ask any questions. To that end, this morning we'll have a number of our key North American team members talking around their areas of speciality, and I'll shortly hand to Jane Whitehead, our RGM for the Americas, and the team who, as you can see here, will take you through a market overview, some of the consumer insights and marketing activity, our PR activity, importantly for many of you, our partnership activity. And then we'll finish uh, with some insights in the business events area before we go into a, a question and answer session uh, that, as I mentioned, I'll facilitate at the end. Uh, so some housekeeping around all of this before I uh, hand to Jane. Uh, in some of our other webinars that we do, we often uh, hear back from people that they have trouble with um, uh, issues with the video. And we often find that's caused by the interconnection, internet connection, sorry, um, at the attendees end. So unfortunately, if you are having issues, there's not much we can do about that. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to watch on demand post this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we are very interested in your uh, questions and answers, so so your questions. So please use the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom there to ask uh, questions of us so that we can attempt to answer those at the back end. Any of the unanswered questions that we have, we'll try to do our best to respond to offline. Um, and that, that, I think, is the main housekeeping issues I wanted to just cover. So on that note, I'll hand over to uh, Jane and the team who will uh, take you through the briefing. Thank you, Lee. And hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, so obviously, you uh, as, are seeing a lot of coverage of the situation, particularly in the US, and it's, it's very hard hit. Um, the, we're approaching nearly 4 million cases now um, in the US um, with over 140,000 um, deaths. Um, Canada, you know, the situation not as severe, um, 113,000 cases um, and uh, 8,900 deaths at the moment. Um, you've seen a, a significant response um, from uh, governments across North America, certainly um, about six trillion in um, in stimulus that the US has um, injected into the economy, double digit unemployment, and as high as twenty percent in some urban areas in in New York and California. Um, we're seeing uh, now as. Uh, the, the approach um, across different states, different cities, different um, counties in the US and, and provinces across Canada has varied. And as we've seen um, some, uh, some states reopening um, in the US, we have seen um, further outbreaks of, of COVID, um, certainly across Florida, Texas, um, California. Um, and the, the, the response has been varied um, across uh, across states, some continuing to sort of press ahead with um, reopening uh, business, some starting to reimpose restrictions. Um, in California, you know, where uh, non uh, non-essential businesses are, are, are shut down again and, and um, stay at home and work from home um, orders remain in place. Um, at the moment, Congress is negotiating um, or considering measures to um, extend unemployment benefits um, beyond the expiration uh, this month. Um, so, you know, a lot of uncertainty, I suppose, um, in terms of the, um, the outlook um, going forward. Just in terms of our approach, we are really approaching our response in, in phases. So certainly with an extended um, lockdown period um, looking likely and, and border restrictions remaining in place for some time, certainly to Australia, we're looking at how we can evolve um, the, uh, the inspirational and virtual activities that we've been doing to continue to engage both our consumer and industry audiences. So certainly, um, since uh, since March, we've um, we've undertaken a number of activities um, to continue to put Australia top of mind for um, 
keep the destination um, on people's radar and inspire consumers to dream about a future trip to Australia, um, to just send a message of, of friendship and um, I suppose a virtual kind of hug. Um, Jackie will take you through some of those activities that we've been doing over, over the recent months. Um, and we have seen really strong engagement um, and we do believe it is important to, um, to continue to maintain a level of investment um, you know, in, um, in search social content um, over the months ahead because we believe that will stand us in better stead as we um, come out of this crisis when um, restrictions are lifted. Um, certainly that's the feedback that we're getting from research and, um, and, and from a lot of, of partners. We will need to evolve our messaging because it's um, certainly looking likely that there will be other destinations that will uh, reopen um, ahead of Australia. So I think we need, we are continuing to challenge ourselves on how our, we keep that messaging fresh and relevant. Um, but certainly we do anticipate that, you know, as a highly aspirational, you know, destination, Australia will have advantages coming out of this. We're getting a lot of feedback that people, you know, that um, will, um, will not want to put off those, um, those, um, experiences that they most want to have and destinations that they most want to have. So certainly um, Australia, you know, which um, per perpetually ranks top of destinations that Americans most want to visit, um, you know, will we'll have some advantages in that. And certainly we offer a lot of the um, experiences, the space, um, you know, the, the great nature and wildlife and um, that people will be and certainly the safety that people will be looking for coming out of it. Um, the perception of it, how Australia has handled the situation, you know, is, is very strong and favourable uh, here. So um, those are all advantages that we, we definitely want to make sure that we're continuing to highlight and, and keep um, the destination um, on people's radar and, and continue to stoke that future demand. Certainly from an industry perspective over recent months, we've pivoted our industry and our travel advisor um, activities to be virtual and had really, really strong response um, and certainly getting a lot of feedback that um, industry wants us to you know, maintain that activity and, and keep that connection going. So the team will take you through the details um, of that uh, shortly. Um, also, I mean, we certainly believe that the, you know, obviously the industry will change um, coming out of this, but we believe that people, um, you know, will rely as much as, as ever on um, travel advisors to navigate um, what's likely to be a more complex, um, you know, travel landscape um, with, you know, different uh, complexities um, uh, post COVID. So, and, diff and different um, safety kind of um, requirements. Um, so we want to make sure that we continue to, um, use this time when um, there is an appetite for, um, you know, upskilling and, and preparing for um, the next stage to make sure that we're um, supporting the industry in that and doing all we can to maintain that um, interest and connection. Um, at the same time, we're planning um, for the, the coming stages when there is an announcement um, on uh, restrictions being lifted, we want to be in a position to really hit the ground running. And we um, we will need to build demand very quickly. We don't know how much notice we'll um, have of when, um, between when the, the opening um, of borders is announced and when it will happen. So we really want to be ready to go. And we know we're going to need to do things differently. We're going to have a very strong emphasis on partnership, looking at how we can, um, uh, take uh, extra steps to support um, industry in restarting their businesses um, and um, and also just staying very connected with industry and to all the research that we can tap into to make sure that we are focusing um, on the segments that will have the highest propensity to travel first. And we believe that certainly there will be an opportunity in the premium space there um, in North America. Um, so that's one we'll focus on um, globally from a tourism perspective, uh, Tourism Australia perspective, we're looking at um, you know, how, how we monitor segments like VFR and, and youth travel um, uh, in, in the immediate restart phase. Um, and so um, we'll certainly be part of that as well. Um, also, aviation recovery will obviously be critical. We are um, in, uh, in regular talks with all of our aviation partners here. Um, we are certainly encouraged that um, in the US and Canada that Australia, um, you know, remains a market that all of our partners are very committed to. Um, and so we'll make sure that we um, are preparing um, and working with um, all of our, our state 
Territory um, Airport uh, partners and feeding into our global aviation recovery strategy to make sure that um, we're doing all we can support that. And then planning for um, you know, the new, new normal and what that may, may look like. Um, so we have our plans ready to go. Um, so with that, I will hand over now to uh, Jackie, who is our um, consumer marketing manager, just to take you through a little bit more of the consumer insights that we've been seeing in the research that we've been doing over recent weeks, um, and also the research that we're seeing in this market, as well as a little bit more detail on the activities that we have been focused on over the next few months. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. So as Jean mentioned, uh, we have been doing research since the beginning of uh, May and late April, really looking at a couple of different elements, consumer confidence, travel intention, booking intention, and uh, whether or not Australia is seen as a safe destination. Uh, this last pool of research that I will take you through is actually from the week of July 2nd to July 7th, which is a very exciting time here in the Americas where uh, celebrated Canada Day, uh, up north and then celebrated the 4th of July here in the States. So we did have a lot of domestic movement across both of those countries, um, a lot of domestic tourism happening during that time. But you can see um, as I go into the next slide that that was also a time where uh, over the past couple of weeks, we've started to see, like Jean mentioned, either the pausing or the reversing of um, some of the opening of our borders here in the US. So you can see in this last wave that there has been a dip in consumer confidence, although confidence is really high in the uh, US market, it has started to dip as we've seen pullback across many of the states and as we've seen COVID increasing as well in many of the states. Um, with that as well, we've seen these uh, declines across travel intention and then also booking intention. Um, but we had, during the period before this last pool of research from May until June, as we were reopening, uh, we did see that confidence and intention were really increasing during that period. So as you know, we go into this next pool, we'll see how the most recent increases in COVID cases um, really have an impact on these areas. However, we would say that, you know, Australia is seen as a safe destination to travel to. There has been a slight dip in this wave, but we've seen really some increased media coverage as we've had the um, pop-ups of cases in Melbourne and most recently in New South Wales. There has been some coverage here in US media. It probably hasn't been as extensive because of the COVID situation in this country, but um, we are seeing a slight impact there. As we look into the Canadian market, um, we are seeing that the consumer confidence is starting to level out. So um, as that market has not been as impacted and seen an increase in COVID cases, uh, the consumer confidence has relatively been stable for the past two pools of data. And uh, we are seeing that for both travel intention and booking intention, that uh, the Canadian market is actually above the US market um, in the next three to six months and then also the next month for booking intention. Um, we are also seeing that Australia is seen as a safe destination as well in the Canadian market with increases continuing um, as we've done these research pools. As we look into some of the key takeaways, I think um, when we look at both the US and the Canadian market, uh, the top two reasons that people are considering travel in the next six months is that they really feel like they need a holiday. And I mean, I would say who doesn't at this point uh, after being cooped up and with stay at home orders and slowly we've seen businesses, different types of businesses reopening and parks reopening. Um, you know, there really is a, a feel that people do definitely want to go on vacation and that they're also missing uh, their friends and relatives that they're used to visiting and traveling. And, you know, like Jane mentioned as well, the visiting friends and relative um, segment is definitely a big opportunity segment as we go and head towards borders reopening. Uh, the main difference here in the top three triggers, triggers that we actually have is that, um, you know, where Americans are actually looking to replace a delayed trip or a canceled trip. So they are definitely um, in the mindset of rebooking and replacing some holiday plans that they have had since mid-March. Um, whereas the Canadians seem to be in this research poll more uh, geared towards looking for good deals on travel and also um, having more opportunities as well as a market that can uh, has open borders with places like Europe as well. 
Um, the top three barriers, we would say no surprises here, that people uh, both in the US and in Canada definitely have a fear of contracting the coronavirus. Um, whereas we have seen that that fear has really increased um, and significantly you can see with the green arrow um, in the Canadian market that there definitely is a strong fear of contracting there. Um, but, you know, the second highest reason is that right now, I think with a lot of um, uncertainty around borders being opening around, you know, where we sit in the wave, where um, we'll have pausing or uh, reversing in some cases of borders opening. Um, there is just some lack of interest in this market in um, traveling internationally at this stage. I think uncertainty is a large driver of that. Um, the US though, the top, the third reason that we actually have is that the financial situation just won't allow it. Um, as Jane mentioned, obviously there is a really high unemployment rate with the way that the um, government packages were set up to actually incentivize people to go on unemployment versus businesses to keep employees. So we see that there is um, just some uncertainty with financial situations. Um, whereas the Canadian market, they're looking um, and trying to minimize the risk of contracting, but not only contracting, but also spreading the virus to others as well. So what we're seeing, um, just some overall trends and uh, insights from our market from a B2C and consumer facing standpoint is that really uh, safety continues to be the focus of messaging across all brands, DMOs, NTOs, partners, uh, you know, car, in the automotive sector, in the travel sector, everyone really is um, putting safety at the forefront, health and safety, not only from a consumer standpoint, but also uh, making sure to message out the safety uh, and health practices that are being put into place to keep their employees safe as, safe as well. So it's really, um, you know, we're seeing this across anything from TV commercials to direct email communications. So really safety is the top of mind. Um, and, you know, in terms of all of the editorial that is also coming out is that we're really seeing this trend of safecation. So really trying to create policies and trying to reduce uncertainty about how do you, you how do you travel in an airplane safely? How do you check into a hotel safely? Um, really just reinforcing that there are not only cleanliness measures, measures in place, but there's also new technology being put into place that is really um, minimizing contact and maximizing safety for the consumer. Um, we're also seeing some trends uh, coming out of SCIF that's really talking about subscription travel, which allows for more flexibility. Um, there's more interest in under-touristed destinations. And then um, it's also driven by some urban living innovations, which is really targeted at the Gen Z uh, to make travel not only more financially accessible, but given the flexibility that they have, uh, this generation has in working, um, in going to school, it's really providing an opportunity for these for this um, segment to stay connected as well. And then we're also seeing that there are some proposals coming up and we've seen this in the Northern Territory as well with some tax incentives to focus on domestic trips. Um, this is really to encourage people to go, you know, to the, uh, as much as, you know, two hours away to the national park to stay um, local, but also just to be able to incentivize people to leave the home, to leave their homes knowing that they can do so safely. And then uh, in another editorial themes we're really seeing is that a shift away from these virtual travel experience, um, really focusing on destinations and experiences that are starting to open. So there are a lot of announcements around borders will open on this date, you know, with Visit Bermuda, with the Bahamas, um, to also, you know, we've seen with the Sydney Harbor Bridge as an example, the Sydney Harbor Bridge is now open as an attraction. So there's definitely a focus from our editorial partners on what's opening, when it's opening, and really just giving, um, you know, as much information as possible out to consumers around what that means in terms of, you know, is it 50% capacity as an example. Um, and then, but what we continue to see as we monitor uh, what other NTOs and DMOs are doing in this market is that uh, it's really inspirational of, you know, keep, keep dreaming about when you can come visit us next, keep dreaming that Australia is the next destination that you want to go on your long haul trip for. Um, but then from a domestic standpoint, we continue to see travel guides for road trips, national parks, solo vacations, um, and the likes. 
So here are just a few examples. Um, you know, there was a proposal out for a $4,000 tax credit for vacations um, in the US. We've seen a few articles posted around these safecations. And then um, just most recently, our partners over at Departures actually posted um, this inspirational piece on how to travel to Australia without ever leaving home. As Jane mentioned, over the past couple of months, um, we have been heavily focused on putting media and inspirational content out across social, um, across our different partners. And really the cornerstone piece of this was the Live from Australia virtual experience. Um, we had, this, was fe this program was started in the middle of May um, and included a domestic focus in Australia, but also a focus um, across international markets like the US and Canada, especially in our market. So uh, this program kicked off with 32 live experiences, um, 27 hours of content that was generated with uh, viewership from 40 plus countries. Um, overall, we had 127 million unique viewers reached globally across social with 6.2 million minutes of content watch. Uh, there was a Facebook event because this uh, content was largely hosted on Facebook and it was also posted on, hosted on YouTube as well, as many of you know, um, where we had nearly 100,000 event responses and 17,000 of those were actually out of the US, which was the third of all regions behind Australia and uh, the UK. Out of the 6.6 .6 million live stream video views, 1.1 million of those were in the US, which was the most of any single region. And then we also, um, we posted on demand content so people could view after the live event in the middle of May. And we saw out of the 26 million uh, catch up video views that there were actually 2.3 million in the US for the program that we ran. And then we actually um, launched a bit later, but had an extended program uh, in Canada where we actually had 4.7 million um, on demand content views, which is really exciting because you can see in our markets, there is a lot of interest in what's going on in Australia. Obviously these focused on a lot of different experiences with some key Friends of Australia hosts. Um, and you can see here, here are a few examples of comments that came out of um, the US, Canada and a few other markets, but there really is um, some travel intent. There. So uh, I'll just read one of the comments here, but would be amazing. I'll just have to fly over from the US, gather my Australian family and enjoy a Tassie vacay. I need to get tuned back into the Aussie half of me. So this is, you know, like we mentioned, obviously someone who has a strong connection to Australia, but lives in the US and really just wants to get back over as soon as possible and uh, just enjoy some of the amazing wonders that Australia has to offer. Uh, in addition to this, we also um, earlier, I guess at the end of 2020, um, in our market, we had a partnership with Travel and Leisure where uh, Australia it was announced as the 2020 destination of the year. Uh, we did recently relaunch this partnership with uh, Dream and Inspirational Content. So this features not only um, a series of articles about all of the states and territories, uh, but we also have a heavy presence across their social channels as well, promoting more Dream and Inspiration content. And we'll continue to run this program through the end of the um, summer into early September as well. So we're seeing um, a pretty significant amount of page views with people reading this content for, and spending anywhere between two to three minutes on average um, consuming it, which is really exciting. Uh, in addition, we're also doing content amplification of um, a lot of the Inspire and Dream content that is available on oz.com. So uh, really trying to make these units run across um, some key travel sites, key news sites, as we know that consumption of all types of media really is um, and continues to be pretty significant throughout this summer period as people are looking to plan and spend time with their families, but also uh, dream about their next trips. So we're doing quite a bit of this and are working with the global team to turn this into an always on program where we're consistently providing um, you know, extended reach of a lot of the editorial and uh, content packs that we have across oz.com. So specifically for um, the PR activity, we did have a few partnerships that were run um, in support of our dreaming and stories and um, really trying to work with editors uh, in the US and in Canada, but also where we have Australian writers on the ground to be able to push these inspirational stories about 
you know, as a few examples, can't get to Australia, take a virtual trip down under, um, featuring some of our wildlife. So against all odds, Koala Star Amwam returns to Australia's bushland after a full and speedy recovery, um, tapping into music. So let Aussie music transport you from your living room. And then even, you know, extending other pieces of Australian culture, like books to experience Australia in your living room. So we continue to build out a really robust content program and editorial partnerships and relationships that are really bringing Australia culture, food, wine, nature, beauty, wildlife, everything uh, to the American and Canadian consumers. And for Live from Oz, um, it was really exciting. We ran a program um, to support this from a PR standpoint in the US and Canada as well, uh, where we had over 710 million impressions to date. So we had a lot of really great coverage from big publications like Thrillist, Forbes, BuzzFeed, National Geographic, Apartment Therapy, et cetera. And we also had a broadcast segment that ran on CTV in Toronto and Vancouver that featured Jane Whitehead, um, who just previously spoke before me, who was teasing the weekend's program and encouraging uh, Canadians to tune in. So really exciting results that we had in this market as well. And what we'll continue to do um, for the remainder of the summer and into the fall as we you know, are in this restricted movement phase is we'll continue to be proactively pitching out these integrated um, interactive experiences that we have available, information around road trips, and uh, continuing to run some partnerships like this. So with that being said, uh, next up, we will have Chris Allison, the Regional Partnership Manager, give a brief aviation update. Cool. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Jackie, and uh, good to um, see everyone on the webinar today. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about um, aviation as it relates to the US and Canada, and then I'll pass over to uh, my team who are going to take you through some of the uh, specific initiatives we've been doing over the last few months to keep our industry engaged. Um, from an aviation perspective, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, we were coming off the back of a, a super strong um, growth period for aviation from both the US and Canada uh, down to Australia. Um, in terms of where we ended pre-COVID, we had 100 uh, non-services uh, a week between um, North America and Canada, 140 of these from the US, 21 from Canada. Um, we were expecting some amazing new services to launch this year with uh, Qantas having their new non-stop services uh, from both San Francisco and uh, more excitingly from Chicago down to Brisbane. Um, and we were expecting a new connecting capacity from the East Coast with Air New Zealand launching their non-stop services from uh, New York down to Auckland and connecting into our, their fantastic uh, route network into Australia from Auckland. Um, so it's fair to say that like um, you know, all the international markets we are seeing, we've had a significant reduction in capacity uh, from our aviation partners. We are down 77% in air capacity over the next three months and we're down at the moment, just to 10, uh, 10 flights a week operating from North America. So um, it's, it's actually interesting to see that we still retain some connectivity. Many of our other international markets haven't been able to maintain connectivity, but we still have United Airlines running their uh, daily service from San Francisco to Sydney. Um, and at the beginning of this month, we saw Delta Airlines uh, relaunch um, a reduced service between uh, Los Angeles and Sydney. So it's great to see that we have got some connectivity there to make sure that we are able to transport particularly expats from uh, both sides of the ocean as, as they need to travel uh, back and forth. I think the, the thing that's driving the at the moment is the, is the really strong strength that we're seeing from our aviation partners in the cargo market, which is allowing them, allowing them to maintain um, and operate some passenger services where they are uh, fulfilling demand for that uh, for that cargo opportunity. Uh, very specific to the US, we don't see that same demand for cargo in Canada, uh, which is why Air Canada uh, for the moment haven't been able to retain any of their uh, connectivity. Um, Jane and I have been staying really close to our aviation partners over the last uh, number of weeks. And as Jane was saying at the beginning of the call, you know, we're really uh, boy the sentiment that our airline partners continue to have to support the Australian market and you know without any exception all are excited to be able to return to the market and see the Australian market as an important part of their network um, as and when travel restrictions will allow them to reinstate services. Um, 
you know, ultimately we, we can't send customers down to market if we don't have aviation capacity. So working with aviation partners and supporting them to restore that capacity as quickly as possible is at the forefront of kind of our strategies as we look to um, support uh, reintroduction of services and, and restart the, uh, the tourism segment. So just wanted to give you as a, as a, a quick uh, overview of, of that. I think the, the important thing from an aviation partner perspective that they tend to look at is, is the booking curve. So in, in the US and Canadian markets, we typically have a sweet spot of um, booking curve of between three and six months before departure. Um, so that, that becomes particularly important for airline partners as they look at uh, capacity for the upcoming uh, northern summer season, so the October through March season, as we look to make adjustments there. Um, so we're keeping really connected with them in terms of how they're kind of altering their strategies um, and looking to redeploy capacity where they can. So we, we continue to keep uh, close to those guys. Um, I'm going to introduce Glenn and Liam shortly just to talk about some of the amazing initiatives that we've been working on as a team to keep our industry on in the US and Canada engaged and, and keep our advisors engaged in Destination Australia. But before I introduce them, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to share with you guys some of the, the core insights we're seeing from, uh, from a B2B perspective. And these focus around these three areas. So we do have hibernation. So unsurprisingly, I, you know, like many of your businesses have had to do is really scale back their business operations. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things that we're continuing to keep uh, close to is many of the industry research and sentiment around what does the shape and scale of the distribution landscape look like post COVID. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of unsurprising, but also a little alarming that, you know, um, industry bodies such as ASTA um, do project um, a significant shrink this year to the tune of around 50%. Um, and we do currently have a 51% unemployment rate within the US travel industry at the moment. I think for us that would be concerning if this trend was to continue into next year as we are able to restart our tourism industry from our US markets. I think that many of you will be aware of the, the partners that are specialists for uh, both New Zealand and Australia. And I think we really feel that it's important that we look to try and support those partners to make sure that they are retained as specialist operators, uh, as wholesalers and retailers for destinations so that we can have uh, specialists continue to champion and, and push, uh, push the market forward. And it'll be really interesting to see how that unfolds over the next few weeks. I think we're already starting to see signs of back to the situation uh, is having on business. You guys will all be aware. Um, Hello World uh, recently made some announcements which saw to an island in the sun business divested and purchased by John and Answers, which was a, a really interesting and surprising move, which uh, sort of came out a little bit from left field from our perspective. But overall, I think a really strong move for those businesses to consolidate um, their focus in the very short term. It's allowed particularly the travel to an island sun in the business to reinstate some of their um, some of their resources to take account of some of the demand they're seeing for nations to do so. Um, so I think it's uh, I think we are likely to expect further um, consolidation uh, going forward. So we, we continue to um, keep uh, keep that. a core piece and um, which I'll just talk, touch on very briefly is engagement because the guys will uh, Go much deeper into that but we're continuing to see a real passion and hunger to stay connected with destination australia at the moment a real hunger for uh, um all all levels of our um, partners and market to keep connected with australia uh, keep on top of what's going on and particularly from an advisor community perspective keep engaged and keep upskilled in what our destinations offer particularly um as we are starting to open up domestically and businesses, businesses are starting to um, adapt their product offering. And um, I think that uh, connection is going to be really important going forward. And I think, which is, I think, really, really important as we focus on um, the, the restart, is that we do, we do continue to see the signs of demand being there. And um, obviously, we can't take advantage of that demand at the moment. I think all of our core partners continue to talk to us about the demand that they're seeing from their customers. Um, the continual uh, inquiry levels that they're getting, particularly into next year. Um, it's just frustrating for them that they can't, obviously with the uncertainty surrounding the border situation at the moment, that they can't uh, take advantage of the demand that is there. And um, so it is becoming quite difficult for them to navigate um, you know, the, the, the demand that is there and provide clarity for their customers due to lack of clarity that we um, don't have on uh, the border situation at the moment. Um, but what we're also seeing is that partners are actually also starting to diversify their offerings. So 
Um, in order for their businesses uh, to remain stable and viable going forward, we're seeing a number of our partners diversifying their off off offerings and um, to take advantage of the demand that is there um, and that where people are travel to and where there is a little bit more certainty. We've seen a number of our partners pivot to offer a domestic a domestic business in the US, domestic business in Canada. Um, obviously in Canada, we're starting to see a stronger opening of uh, destination travel corridors with Europe opening up, etc. So I think it's great to see that whilst um, you know, our partners, particularly a particular subset of them are you know, passionate and focused on the South Pacific destinations, that they are being mindful of how they need to sustain their businesses in the short term and are diversifying um, as a result to do so. So I think we will continue to see that you know, happen in this market as you know, businesses um, you know, look to remain viable and take advantage of where demand is. Can't uh, well, we can't fulfill that demand for Australia at the moment. So that's just a general overview. I'm going to hand over to uh, some amazing members of my team, my son Liam Sweeney, and they're going to take you through together uh, some of the amazing initiatives that we've been up to uh, to keep our partners engaged over the last uh, few weeks and months. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Chris, and good day, everybody from a very tropical New York City. So as Chris mentioned, we've, uh, we've had some great success with some of our distribution activities over this past year. Um, and many of you will know that that is um, very focused around travel advisor training, particularly over this last period, quarter four. Um, our numbers in the past year in the financial year are looking really, really good. So as you can see, we trained nearly 11,000 travel advisors from the US and nearly 3,000 across Canada. So some really strong results. And that training is delivered in a number of different ways through face-to-face -face training at either um, events or in-store or also uh, webinar training as well. Um, our Aussie specialist numbers are looking really, really good from North America. So what was really exciting is that we welcomed an extra 1,000 advisors to the Aussie specialist program this year. That's qualified Aussie specialists. Um, and that's a really good result compared to what we saw last year. Um, and what's really exciting and probably the most satisfying of all these results is that uh, the advisor network is really satisfied with what we're doing. So they, uh, as you can see, they're 99% of advisors that were surveyed as part of our Aussie Specialist Global Survey, so that they're really satisfied with the activities that we offer them. Um, and most importantly, that 100% of them said that the activities that we're doing help them sell more um, Australian vacations. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, and just moving on to our quarter four activity. So, uh, we put in place a really strong trade engagement program, just trying to move to the next one there, there we go, um, in quarter four, which coincided with that lockdown period here in the US. Um, and as you can see there, we saw some fantastic results and this really tapped into that desire for, from, from the um, Travel Advisor Network across North America to really upskill and learn during this lockdown period. Um, so we saw a 600% increase in the number of travel advisors registering for the Aussie Specialist Program than we would normally in an average month of the year. And what's really exciting is that we moved over 500 of them from trainees through to qualified Aussie Specialists. So they've moved right through the program and increased their knowledge. Um, what was really exciting as well is that we saw nearly 3,000 state and territory modules completed during that period. Um, so it really goes to show that those um, advisors that were already in our network were really keen to increase their knowledge and upskill. We also lifted our um, webinar game during this period. So we created a weekly webinar series called the Wednesday Walkabout. Um, and this was all about um, making our webinars short and sharp, more conversational, not just focused on a presentation. Webinars are nothing new to this market. As you know, the size of the market means that we have to do a lot of webinars, but uh, we saw an, uh, an increase of about 30% based on our webinar attendance, what we would normally do during the uh, normal times. Um, so nearly 2000 travel advisors joined us on this webinar program. So it was really, really successful. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Glenn. Um, yeah. And look, over the over the space of the 12 weeks during the initial sort of lockdown and the stay at home orders, um, we created some uh, trade media, which we leveraged off of the With Love From Oz message, um, creating weekly updates to the industry. Um, these messages had click throughs, taking agents back to our Aussie specialist webpage um, to help engage agents with our training platform. Um, to help grow their knowledge. Uh, this proved to be really, really successful with a high engagement rate, um, which sort of helped grow our Aussie specialist numbers, as Glenn was just mentioning before. Um, and with so many uh, agents working from home and obviously also having their kids at home with them of late, um, we thought it'd be a great idea to sort of not only help grow their agents' knowledge, but also produce some 
crossword puzzles and some coloring sheets like you can see here that sort of helps engage the adults but also has some fun for the kids as well so coloring pages and such for for the kids or the adults whoever would like to do the coloring pages um, which was a really really fun engaging way of learning a little bit more about Australia and talking more about Australia with their families um, we also collected a bunch of virtual experiences from right across the country uh, this was to enable advisors who would probably normally be traveling themselves or be on for meals, that sort of thing, uh, to not only grow their knowledge, but get a really like a better feel and understanding of some of the great destinations that Australia has to offer and, and make them feel like they have sort of been there themselves and, and able to sell it better in the future. Um, a big part of what we do here in the US is working with travel consortia groups. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with the travel consortia group, it's basically a collective of travel agents and travel agencies uh, that sort of pay a membership fee and, and pay to combine their resources, which increases their footprint. Um, obviously this includes their sort of their buying potential, uh, the benefits that they get, the commission levels, and also has a largely increased sort of marketing budget for them. Um, we work really closely with the three consortia groups that you can see here, the Travel Leaders Network, Signature Travel Network, and Virtuoso. Um, and, and by working with these three consortia groups, um, we get to work alongside our STO partners and we're able to reach a large number of travel advisors to grow their knowledge of Australia by offering regular updates on Australia, doing training sessions with them. Um, as uh, Glenn mentioned before, we do quite a lot of webinars um, where sort of agents are incentivized to complete the Aussie specialist program um, to grow the Aussie specialist numbers. And they can even win some small like Aussie prizes along the way. Um, this has been largely helpful in, in growing out Aussie specialist numbers here in the US. We've also been keeping our key distribution partners up to date and engaging with them th throughout this period. So many of you will be familiar that we work with about eight to 10 South Pacific or Australia, New Zealand specialists in this market. Um, and we've been keeping them up to date with a fortnightly KDP morning tea. So we get them all on a Zoom call and we keep everybody up to date and we have a, over a, a cup of coffee and um, talk through any issues and share insights and uh, generally stay up to date with some news um, and just basically keep engaged. We've also implemented a industry update webinar series where we're keeping the broader uh, North American industry up to date with what's going on down in Australia and what we're up to. Um, we're also in the middle of our virtual product showcase at the moment. This is for frontline KDP teams to keep them up to date with um, Australian products and just generally keep up that engagement with them. Another industry opportunity for you would be the um, Australia Marketplace Online. Applications are now open for this event. Uh, they're open for another 10 days or so, so jump on and, and, and register. But this is an event which is taking place over a period of four days in October. Um, and you know, jump on, register, we'd love to see you. Um, if we can't see you up in market, we can hopefully see you virtually at this event. So thank you. And um, so I'm gonna hand you over to Marianne McDonald, who's gonna take you through business events, insights and activity. Marianne. Hi everybody, it's great to see so many familiar names on the list uh, for the event. So I'm gonna take you through the business events. Uh, whoopsie, I went back the wrong way, sorry. Oh, gee. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna take you through uh, insights for business events. The difference between business events and the consumer market is we have very long lead times. So normally, uh, you know, a, a business event, a conference, an incentive group, a world Congress, they're not booked within months, they're booked usually within years. So the booking window is much longer than on the consumer side of things. The other difference right now is that a lot of our planners are so busy because they've had to push everything. First, they pushed it into October, November situation for 2020. Then they've realized that's not going to happen face to face meetings. And that's both domestic and international. They're not going to happen now. So they're now having to push them again. So instead of you know, canceling something, what they're doing is they're postponing, they're recontracting, they're dealing with all sorts of legal issues and that sort of thing. So our planners are very busy at the moment, as all, you know, as all people in the travel industry might be, but we need to keep aware of that in the way that we communicate with them. So what do the planners want from us right now? They want facts. Uh, they want facts on how COVID has been managed in Australia. 
the travel restrictions, even if we don't know everything, sanitization processes. And from venues and, and the industry, what they want are, are um, flexible contracts and that sort of thing, because they're having, you know, they don't know, the uncertainty is really a, a big issue for them. So for incentives and corporate meetings, just to give you an idea, the 2020 winners, they're going, they may be rolled into the 2021 rewards programs, travel programs, if they can occur, or they're using, you know, and if they do, they might be smaller waves, or they may take individual trips or be able to use the bookings that were made for them that, for a trip that was canceled. So they're learning all sorts of ways to deal with it. For the corporate market, uh, for corporate meetings, and that's incentives as well, they're financially impacted. So we need to bear that in mind. And they're incredibly risk averse. You know, if they're, if they're um, trying to put, uh, you know, send their staff on a conference or an incentive trip, they have to be really careful in case they do contract the virus. So for the association markets, the association meetings, they, they will continue as hybrid or fully virtual. That's a prediction. They need to continue. Association meetings are where the research is done, where, uh, where members of these particular associations gain their, um, they, they publish papers and that's how they, they continue and they rise up in the industry. It's also the way that, that associations actually survive. That's what funds the associations to stay alive. They need to hold meetings. So they will be hybrid or virtual. One, one silver lining was one event that we knew they had, they, they had an event for about 3000 continually every year. And they're trying to figure out how to grow the membership. They had to turn it to virtual. They got 30,000 registrants. So that's a silver lining for them. Uh, and then for the sectors that are doing well, no surprise, healthcare and pharma, technology, surprise, all this virtual stuff, and um, professional associations. Less activities, you know, you can see on the screen what they are. So the opportunities we have, you know, echoing what, what Jane and others have said, the long, well, what I said first, the long lead times, but also the bucket list destination. People are saying life is short. Maybe I will really work hard to get on that incentive program. Maybe I will go to that conference in Australia that I always thought was too far. I really want to go now. Uh, the Australian exchange rate is incredibly attractive to Americans and we highlight that all the time. Our funding, our bid fund is also another thing that we, you know, it's a, it's a key selling point for us. The COVID management of Australia, as others have said, is it's they're aware of it here. They know that we've done it very well in Australia. The sparse population of wide open spaces. One of our taglines has always been uh, big landscapes inspire big thinking. And that, that's the key. They know they can send their you know, incentive programs to places where there aren't many um, people there actually. We did a lot of research. Well, we've done, we've done research. The way we've reached out to people is very soft touch approach. Um, we've maintained engagement with them, you know, deepened our relationships, but it's been very soft touch phone calls, emails, that sort of thing. And we also held, we just held two customer advisory panels uh, in the US, one for the incentive and corporate meetings market, one for associations. And they gave us some great feedback on how to actually engage with our, uh, with the planners here in the US and in Canada. And, it, and that helped form our strategy for the new experiences that we're, that we're developing, which you can see below. So we've done calls, phone calls, email activity, we sent gifts to our you know, key planners. And we're also attending industry trade shows and conferences when we can. I, I've attended a few and there's some down here that I will do. So coming up, we're doing a business events virtual experience, which will be something that we mail to our key planners here. Uh, we're developing live broadcasts. So we're, there'll be live broadcasts, not just a standard webinar, which again was based on feedback from our customer advisory panels. And they'll be featuring crosses to Australia and that sort of thing. We're also developing a USA showcase. So that's uh, very much like uh, the consumer ones you've been doing. It'll be group appointments and that's being developed right now as we speak. Training, training webinars are ongoing. We did several in, in April, May, and even one in June, but now they're going, no, they're webinared out, you know, and, and it's not actually the time because in June there was a great, you know, it was really bad in April, May. Then in June they went, oh yeah, this will happen and everything's going to come back. And then now with the rising cases, everybody's having to redo everything again. So it's not, it's simply not the time to be selling to them uh, in that regard. So we need, we're, you know, very much aware of that, that uh, tendency here in the mood of the nation. So there are some industry events I'm going to. Um, Incentive Live is, is an industry virtual trade show. That's for the incentive market, the North Star Meetings Group. 
ASAE is the American Society of Association Executives. That's for the association side of things. Chris Altricoso, who's based in New York, will be attending that. CVEC Connect is one that's, uh, it's, CVEC is the, the main platform for RFPs for business events across the world. And so there you have a conference. So we'll be attending that and partners may be able to come with that, us on that. And then Planet IMEX. Planet IMEX is to replace, uh, well, it's, it's because IMEX America, which is our biggest trade show of the year, was canceled. Uh, it was obviously canceled. It was due to be held in Las Vegas in October. So they canceled it and they hold something called Planet IMEX, which is, it's much more um, educational segments and also networking activities. It's not a, a trade show, they're not running it as a trade show, but we'll be involved in that as well. And then for our, our marketing activities, all of that is managed out of Australia by our Sydney team. And so I just wanted to give you a few examples we, uh, they, so they can do the heavy lifting. Uh, what, was, what we've done is um, there's been a, uh, we're mindful of the, of the mood and the content, obviously, so there's no hard sell. We've got a refreshed creative strategy. Uh, we're a website review, content and social strategies review and development of tangible tangible selling tools and toolkits. So our media buy, you can see down there, we've got five minutes with Julie Ford from Hamilton Island and what Australia means to me. Those were both through meetings today and then preview of the Australian Survival Pack. And we also just launched an a Instagram account for Business Events Australia. Uh, so that's, you know, that's designed to, to deliver content and to inspire for future events. And that um, we also, with the incentive market, we target the premium market as well. So, with that, there ended the lesson, and I will now um, uh, invite the rest of the team back for the question and answer session. Great. Uh, thanks, Marianne, um, and thanks everyone else for all your contributions there. That, that was uh, ex extremely informative. I thought, um, right, we, um, Surprisingly, we have not had any questions come in um, through the course of this. So if there's anyone out there who does want to ask something quickly, we do have seven or eight minutes. We did have a question emailed into us overnight, which I'll, um, I'll ask Jane uh, shortly. But if you've got anything that's burning um, as an attendee and you do want to ask something, then uh, send it through now in the Q&A. Otherwise, yeah, I'll get Jane to um, tackle this question and then uh, we'll wrap things up and of course you know many of you on online here will know how to reach us anyway but anyway that question that came in overnight jane was um can the team comment on what the appetite is for travel overseas by the high-end market since the most recent explosion of COVID cases in the us and also the time frame for forward bookings and travel being contemplated yeah really interesting question um as i mentioned we really do see that there will be um, a strong opportunity in the premium space, um, you know, coming out of this crisis, um, we do expect, and certainly we're hearing from industry partners, um, you know, that there, there is interest um, now, you know, people, um, there's, there's an appetite to, 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 to travel, it's just the ability to travel, um, you know, particularly in the premium space. I think if you look at, um, you know, the stock market uh, here, it points to the varied impact or economic impact of this crisis across different segments because incredibly the S&P 500 is actually um, you know close to levels that it started the year at which is amazing considering the situation and I think it reflects obviously this is an unprecedented crisis but there has been an unprecedented response in terms of the stimulus that has you know gone into the economy so obviously there are many industries that are hurting badly um, unfortunately ours um, but you know there are other sectors you know um, like this you know tech companies that are um, not only you know um, going well but growing um, actually out of um, this this whole situation so I think you know there are people that um, you know while there are you know, a lot of people suffering awfully. There are also people that are still, you know, um, in, in a good position and able to travel. Um, so that's why we just do believe it is going to be really important to um, over, you know, the coming months maintain both the inspirational, you know, consumer content and, and messaging. Um, and there were some examples that you've seen of that, um, but also stay really close to and continue to engage, um, the, you know, the advisor community that we know is really important in, in reaching those premium consumers and that we expect premium consumers will rely on heavily um, coming out of this situation. And, you know, again, for that premium customer, I think Australia just really will 
offer you know everything that we understand that they will be looking for coming out of this situation in terms of the amazing you know bucket list you know experiences but also you know the safety and the quality um, that, that people will be um, be looking for um, is there anything that the rest of the team would like to add on that okay um uh, one of the we have had a couple of questions come through while you know, you've been talking so one from uh, uh jeff down in penguin land uh g'day jeff how are you uh philip island um what is our biggest selling point is it fresh air wide open spaces safe um question question compared to other destinations all of those things um you know i think you know certainly in our um you know, in our messaging and our content, um, we we're, we're sort of continue to highlight the amazing experiences, both you know, nature and, and wildlife, um, the mix of um, indigenous and, and modern culture. Um, certainly, you know, the great food and wine, um, and you know, the personality of Australia as well, um, and, and the people that we were sort of really bringing forward um, in terms of our marketing. But I think just now, with the added um, advantage of of space, quality, safety, you know, that people will, you know, certainly be looking for um, in a post-COVID um, world. I think we, you know, can um, certainly, um, as I mentioned up front as well, I mean, there's, there's definitely a perception that Australia has handled this situation well. And I think that just, you know, will give people confidence when they're thinking about Australia as a destination after this situation. Cool. Um... Another one that's come in, this may have been covered off, but uh, it's from Angela Freeman uh, from Hartley's Creek up in North Queensland. Good day, Angela. I uh, saw you up there last week. I was fortunate enough to be up in Port Douglas and Cairns last week. Um, beautiful this time of year. Um, Angela has asked, is there anything of particular interest to the agents just to help with the pitch of our communications? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll happy I'll take that one. So I think... Um, so I think right now we're starting to see more appetite from agents to hear about how the product experience has been evolving um, with the restrictions that are in place how to operate in a COVID safe environment. So I think that will just continue to elevate over the coming weeks and months. You know, obviously for Australia, um, from an international perspective, um, some customers there at the moment is, is, it doesn't exist. But I think the agents are still keen to be educated on how the product experience is evolving and what the what the experience for the customer um, for that product in a COVID safe environment. So I think any of that type of information I think is really um, valued and uh, sought after by our agents here in this market at the moment. Yeah, and I can add to that for the business event side of things. They really, as I said, they want facts and information. And for, we give a general, you know, we'll be giving general overviews and we're developing a fact sheet that a, or a, uh, you know, a situation where they can access it online and we'll just update on, you know, the travel restrictions and all that sort of stuff. That's what they want. We're working, we're developing that. But from particular venues like yours, Angela, um, for the business events market, um, you know, they want to know how you're going to do the social distancing, how you're going to do the, the uh, catering, all that sort of thing, and the cleanliness and the sanitization. So they, they will get granular, granular on that. They'll also want flexible contracting conditions because they're it's so uncertain for them now and so that if they can if they know that they've got that comfort that they can work with you on on the contracting conditions as well All right, perhaps uh one more here and then we uh, might wrap it up this has come from uh, ken holmes i um, not sure who might want to take this one uh are there any opportunities for extended five-day guided private tours between Sydney and Brisbane or Brisbane to Port Douglas so that flying is restricted between cities. What, what does the team think of that? Um, um, I think, um, so I think Lee, that type of um, premium focused itinerary, I think, um, you know, the, the, the is always looking for new and different options there. I think. Mm. In terms of providing that, that so that it restricts flying between cities, um, I'm not sure we're seeing necessarily any any insights or appetite for that in particular at this stage. Obviously, as we get closer to customers booking and traveling again, we, we may see some different emerging trends. You know, I think typically for this market, um, you know, customers are cash rich and time poor when they come to Australia. So flying is inevitable as they look to kind of maximize their time. Yeah. Um, 
but you know as i say kind of where it's a bit unknown at this stage in terms of what trends or new emerging trends will come out for customers as they start to kind of seriously consider things going forward so i would say you know in the consideration set in terms of looking at new and different things to differentiate the experience i think is always welcome to this market Okay, fantastic. Look, we have just hit 11 o'clock on our hour. So look, I might wrap things up here now uh, with a thank you to all our attendees who've stayed online uh, and to all our speakers at all our uh, different time zones over there in, in the US and um, in Canada. So uh, thank you everyone for participating this morning. This was the first of a series. Um, so we will be having more of these over the coming week and then in three or four months time, we'll run these again. Um, we will be sending an email with a link to the recording, so that'll happen uh, shortly. So uh, you'll all be able to access that. And there'll also be a very short survey. I think it's two or three questions that'll be sent to all the participants after this um, webinar uh, so that we can, it'll help guide us on how we improve these going forward. But on that note, look, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone again and uh, enjoy the rest of your days or evenings, depending on where you are. Thanks everyone. Thank you Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye everybody.